very much. Um, indeed, uh, I've worked on many systems and I was, uh, and including things like automation and machine learning for the various systems. Here I was asked to present features of other things than Lean, so don't think of it as me bashing and showing how other things are better, but it's rather, well, what could be there, what still could be implemented, and why this tribalism uh, exists, what can we do about it, maybe or maybe not, maybe there are some inherent issues with it. Uh, we indeed have a really large number of proof assistants today, uh, I've just thrown in some list of older systems, so this list doesn't uh, include Lean, for example, uh, so we have all the systems in the whole family, whole four, whole light, proof power, whole zero, even with one single logic, many people have decided to create their own implementations that will differ with various features. For MISA, we have variants. For PVS, COC, and so on. There's so many systems. Why do we have these? What do they differ in? That's what I'll try to uh, tell you a bit about today. The main things, the main somehow characteristics, but I'll dive into the details, are going to be the foundations. So what logic does it implement? And there have been foundation wars forever, so I will not go into the foundation war here, whether type theory is better than set theory or so, I will uh, not discuss this at all, but just mention what is possible in one or in the other. Uh, I will talk about some, a bit about the interaction mode, so what is the way that you are actually uh, dealing with a system, what automation exists, this is a major thing, if a certain mathematical property is obvious, you think, well, this should be an immediate step, you should know it from the previous steps, why does my prover not show it immediately? Why does it not understand it? Uh, that is, again, a major thing that systems differ in. Libraries, um, it's kind of not an issue because if I'm missing a part of a library, then why don't I just spend another week and implement my probability theory in my system and just have it and, and not consider this. But apparently, parts of the libraries have been easier to construct in some systems than the others. This is why inherently there is some bias, and I'll show this in a moment. And there is the issue of trusting systems. So in principle, proof of systems are supposed to be trusted. We are supposed to believe that whatever we proved in them is true, but bugs creep in. And we've been hearing about bugs in many implementations. There have been issues uh, in COC, some issues with the termination checker, which meant that some of the basic uh, inductive definitions that you could write were problematic. In Isabel, there have been an issue with some dependencies uh, when specifying type classes. And there have been uh, other things that come in. Many of those are not even disclosed. Some of those are on the developer's mailing list discussed only quickly patched up. And then, because the intention is, if nobody has exploited it, that's okay, we, we close it up and it's fine. Some of these are really very hard to exploit. You would have to do something crazy to, to do it, but some of those might be unintentional and that is the dangerous thing. If you could unintentionally prove something that actually is inconsistent that we don't want. I'll be going through various um, features, various characteristics that systems have. For some of those, I have been aiming to focus on things that Lean either does not have or has these features developed to a lesser extent to somehow uh, give you a hint what else could exist. And it's both uh, to, it's maybe not try system, but rather think how you can add it or could we add it, could we do it even better? So the first thing uh, I'll discuss is these libraries. Um, I have already mentioned that libraries are somehow biased, and if you look at the Mizar uh, mathematical library, 90% of the results in Mizar are going to be core mathematics. There's almost no computer science. On the other hand, if you look at the Isabel library, more than 50% of it is computer science results. 
what do I mean by mathematical results or computer science results? Like we could think, well, uh, one is a part of the other. Um, by mathematics, I mean analysis, algebra, topology, and so on. Whereas computer science results means properties of programs, of protocols, algorithms, and so on. This is actually rather surprising. Uh, and it comes from both who is the user of a system and what is easy to formalize in the system. I'll quickly switch to the um, recent parts of both libraries. So why am I discussing these two libraries? These two libraries are arguably the largest two libraries of formalized mathematics today with hopefully the lean library to join the two very soon because it's been the fastest growing one. But, uh, but it's still in the metrics that I've seen missing quite a bit uh, when it comes to joining these two in the size. Um, so if you look at the recent articles in the Mesar library, we have properties of Euclidean spaces, polynomials, existence of algebraic closures, sum of prime reciprocals, and so on. Uh, whereas if you look at the recent articles in the archive of formal proofs, there are some mathematical ones, but there's also a number of things about parsing, coding, algorithms, and so on. So that, that is what I mean by formalizations that are focusing on a particular domain rather than on another one. And why is this? Well, Mizar presents math nicely, but has a weaker automation, whereas Isabel would have much stronger case analysis and much stronger automation for like going through these little things and repeating things automatically. But on the other hand, it would not be as good uh, when it comes to presenting standard mathematics just because of its foundation. I'll be going through various uh, things that we would like to have in a proof assistant. The first one I'll uh, discuss is computer algebra-like features. Where does this come from? Um, 10 years, so actually 25, almost 30 years ago, there was a so-called QED manifesto, which, in, which was a, well, a manifesto, so a document, informal document written by unknown people with the intention of, let's try to formalize all of undergraduate mathematics or even further, and we'll do it in a certain way, some people at the workshop have gathered and aimed to do this. 20 years later, at the meeting of the QED plus 20 workshop, several mathematicians joined and are, are asking, what happened? This was supposed to be done. 20 years have passed. We still don't have all of undergraduate mathematics. And an additional issue that was mentioned is uh, mathematicians are still very hesitant to use uh, proof assistant. So I'm very happy to have you here uh, at the workshop and interested and uh, we'll, we'll see. Um, but uh, the, uh, the thing that several mathematicians said is com computer algebra systems are regularly used by mathematicians. Late regularly used by mathematicians because the systems help you. Whereas a proof assistant somehow slows you down. Making sure that everything is correct actually slows you down. So what can be done about it, one thing that can be done about it is get a lot that can be done by a computer algebra system assistant, have it certified and have it completely correct. And this has been going on already for quite a while. Already in the 90s, we had more than 10 uh, links between theorem proving systems and computer algebra. Uh, the way this used to work is you are working on some expression. This expression is translated and sent to a computer algebra system that performs a simplification, sends it back, and you see, well, the next step is supposed to look like this. So I've, let's say, normalized your poly polynomial or solved your equation, and it's up to you to prove that this is true, but I'm doing the step for you with some kind of link. Today, uh, so, or um, maybe let's step slower. Uh, in uh, 2000s, we had the first certified computer algebra systems, so, or let's call it implementations of parts of computer algebra inside uh, formal proofs. So here 
this is still syntax from uh, 15 years ago, so this doesn't look very nice, but uh, that's why I've written it twice. The, uh, the derivative of some definite integral is equal to something, and that is uh, something that you can call a conversion on, and it returns a theorem, a certified theorem of it, and you can do other things with it. You can do num numerical approximation, you can solve equations, and so on. Um, so what do I mean by numerical approximation? The square root of some number up to eight digits is equal to this number plus a dot, dot, dot. And this dot, dot, dot is something that we are guaranteed that this is less than uh, eight, um, less than 0 0.80 and the one, right? So that's a, this can be hidden in the output. That's the idea of a numerical approximation. So we really have an equality thanks to the dot, dot, dot and things like solving equations. Over time, this has been pushed pretty far. Um, there are uh, people like Bohua Zhang at the Chinese Academy of Science who has been developing a system for uh, solving more complex integrals. So some of those that computer algebra systems cannot solve in one step where you are performing some transformations and all of this is done with proofs. I will again click on the link. Uh, where is it? Click. So here we have a number of interesting integrals that that uh, that have been uh, there's just too many to go through you can see the size of the scroll bar uh, there are a number of these that that can be solved with the help of the system and these are certified proofs and they are beyond what uh, a typical computer algebra system can do so this is pretty exciting and we have a lot of work in other groups with things like matrices, so the triple L algorithm, the Gram-Schmidt normalizations and things like this. And for uh, the, the group of Jesus Aranzai has been essentially trying to formalize parts of the Kenzo computer algebra system. So the, this means some properties of groups and things in topology. So some things like compute and order, those would be already done in a proof assistant. And again, these, are things that people are doing in their favorite system. So here we see uh, these last two are things done in Isabel. The previous one is in some set theoretic system. It doesn't matter. The thing is you are comfortable with your system. You add this feature because this is what you need, but we don't have it everywhere. So that's, it would be very cool to have computer algebra in every system, but we don't have it. And we have these simplifications. So what I've shown on the previous slide Things like computing a simple derivative of, over an integral that I think is today everywhere. That even a simplifier can do it because this is essentially uh, some higher order rewriting, conditional, whatever, but it, it, can, it can be done. The more complex things really require heavy formalization and uh, efficient algorithms implemented, and that's not there in most systems. The next thing I want to focus on are counterexamples. Um, anecdotically, most of the cases when you try to formalize something, what you initially state is actually false. By false, I mean there's something missing, like you got some little part in the definition wrong. Sometimes it's just, oh, this property is supposed to hold for all natural numbers, but zero, and you forgot to write that n is different from zero. And um, how can the system help you. Like if you're then going to try to apply automation, the property is false, it's not going to be able to prove it, but maybe it can actually disprove it. It could show that uh, for zero, this does not hold. There are several approaches to automation. I'm going to show the two in Isabel now. A few systems have some kinds of this. Um, the first way to deal with counterexamples is to use uh, quick check. So for a fragment of whole that can be translated to ML, we can try to generate code and instantiate it with random values. This is the same thing that, uh, that Haskell does, and uh, we can indeed sometimes found, find problems uh, with programs. Isabel can translate programs to ML, instantiate it, evaluate it for 0, 1, 2, but essentially it's using random values, not, not enumerating them. And if a property that you're trying to prove does not hold, it's going to say, no, this is false. Don't continue. I found the counterexample. 
this was the technology used um, quite a while ago already, maybe 10 years ago. More recently, uh, we have essentially finite model finders. So a uh, tool like Nitpick in Isabel generates first order constraints and passes them to a tool that's going to translate them to a um, SAT system. So essentially trying to find a given a universe size, try to find a model that's going to refute your thing that you're proving. So here's an example. Let's say I'm stating a lemma. There exists a function g such that for all x, g of f of x is x. Then for all y, there exists an x such that y is equal to fx. So some property. Is this true? Is this false? Just checking if anyone is awake already. It's past 10, so we should be awake. <laughs> it should be a quick thing, like it seems like, and just move the function to the other side that works out. But then if you think about the function having some of these uh, injective, surjective properties, if this is not the case, then it says need be found a counterexample, and uh, we have the alpha and beta are the source and the target of the function. So one of them has a universe two, one of them has a universe one. It says, oh, I have a function like this, the other function like that, and this actually does not hold. Such a function, G, cannot, uh, cannot exist, so we're done. Uh, this is pretty, uh, pretty cool. And the additional thing is when you are writing your proof, you're typically going to write a statement and think, oh, this is obvious, I'll prove it later, you continue with other things, but uh, it's go the interface is going to call such counterexample finder behind the scenes for a second or two, and is going to try to automatically then highlight in, in yellow on the, on the box a triangle, no, I found a counterexample here, so you may want to go back to it and rephrase it because working on other things is not going to help you. There's a similar thing for automation. If something is trivial, then it's also going to show, well, this is trivial, I, can, I could auto-solve it, but uh, that's more rare. Whenever you're done with presenting your results, it's you want to share them with other mathematicians, with other people who could be interested. And so uh, there is the whole thing about presenting results in LaTeX or on the web. Uh, and today, most systems have some nice rendering things, but how good these are quite differ still. So if you think about something like um, something like the AFP, if you go to any AFP entry, so this is actually the most recent one, the one that I uh, showed you from the list, uh, there is a document created for each entry, which has a nice header with a little bit of a, of a text written by the user, but then, if you look at it, this is still actually almost original formalization text. Some of the things are nicer, say the arrows are nice, LaTeX arrows, the apostrophes or whatever, so certain symbols have been beautified, but in the end, what you read does not look like normal mathematics. A feature that has been um, created in the Mizar proof system is a rendering of proofs that is actually quite nice. So this is, well, I maybe chose, a, uh, chose an easier to render article here, but uh, the way they do this is for every single formalization, they create an entry in a journal, a journal of formalized mathematics, which is automatically generated, but then the editors of the library are verifying that it looks nice and checking that the symbols are nicely rendered. But the, an original article that looks like a formalization, which reserves some types for variables and then uh, states some assumptions and proves theorems is automatically rendered as the following. So here I actually included a crop of the PDF of, uh, of what was generated. For simplicity, we adopt the following convention. These are the natural numbers, these are real numbers, and so on. Let us consider x. We introduce x is irrational as an antonym for x is rational. Let us consider we consider this as a synonym. We can prove the following propositions. If P is a prime, then the square root of P is irrational. There exists X, Y such that X is irrational and Y is irrational and X to the Y is rational. So it looks very nice. There's something minor where we see that 
uh, x to the y is a synonym of x to the y, which is a boring line, and that is the thing that needs to be somehow cleaned. There's something that, that disappeared in the erasure of notations, but everything else, I think it's pretty close to a thing that you can already almost submit to a, uh, submit to a journal. Well, I mean, this part is the boring part, but the further part where you're doing something more interesting, it's, it's pretty cool. Similarly, so, so this was Mizar. Uh, similarly, Isabel has the cool features that you can um, generate documents from, from uh, formalizations and people are typically writing slides in Isabel. So I have a slide where there are going to be some theorems and the references to objects are going to be formal references in the usual documentation thing that I am referring to an object and the compiler verifies that this links to a certain thing that actually exists, what is the type, and, and all of this is, is completely correct. So that's, I'm quite happy about. So this is the more latex side. And then there's, of course, the web. So presenting results on the web also is uh, pretty important. One of the oldest uh, interface, web interfaces for proof assistance was this proof web. I worked on a part of this uh, during my PhD, but later it, developed in, it evol evolved into several other projects. So we had something like a math wiki, which allowed collaborative working on mat mathematical formalization. So this is essentially in the style of proof wiki, we have links between articles where people can formalize things and whenever you are uh, unhappy about something, whenever you want to add something, you, you click edit. And when you click edit, you get an interface that is the full featured interface to the proof assistant. So here, this is a uh, cock proof where you can edit it, you see the results. And as soon as you save it, it gets back in the wiki nice presentation mode. Several more advanced versions of such wikis for Koch and Mizar have been uh, developed, uh, mostly by Karl Stanking. Um, so this was essentially his PhD a few years ago. The main issue there is attracting a community. It, it feels like if you have some little open things that could still be finished in a project, well, you leave it open and you hope that someone visiting such a wiki are going to just complete the small proof and be happy about it. But without further incentives, this is not happening so far. So if you think about Wikipedia, there are lots of people who are excited and doing this. Why are we not doing such things? I think it's really about attracting a community to this, but I am, Quite, I would be quite interested in a system for uh, multiple provers that work in this way could actually, again, be created that has all the nice features. I will spend a moment talking about automation and in particular automation that includes machine learning. Mm, the systems differ quite a lot in the automation possible and that already mostly comes from the foundations. If your foundation has a certain typing rigor, then you can apply more or less automation to it, or even the classical axiom, having the classical axiom as an underlying thing in the foundation means that you can automatically use stronger automated reasoning techniques. So SAT solving, which is arguably one of the most efficient things that we know for uh, efficient automation would rely on assuming that every single uh, proposition can be true or false. Similarly, the resolution and all the extensions of the resolution calculus. The most efficient first order to your improvers are again the classical ones. They rely on extensions of resolution with properties of equality. So we have paramodulation, superposition calculus, and so on. Um, and being able to use those significantly aids the power of a proof assistant. The very important feature that whenever it's available uh, and sufficiently strong uh, of proof assistance would be so-called hammer systems. When I'll very shortly remind how it works inside to, to discuss a little bit the features that they have in different systems. Given a goal in a proof assistant, we can try to find 
parts of the library that are related, translates these parts to the language and the logic of an automated tier improver. And if such a prover finds a proof, we can try to reconstruct the proof and get back an original ITP proof. This has been a great feature for many systems. So I have here a uh, whole light Isabel, but uh, we have the Cockhammer since last ITP. So that's, I think, uh, um, a month ago. Uh, we have uh, we have the Metamath Hammer. And so, so there are quite a few of these and they are uh, pretty exciting. The way they, they typically would, can be thought about is this is a strong premise selection technique. We have a library with tens of thousands of lemmas and we want to figure out which ones of those are useful for our proof. Typically with tens of thousands of lemmas, I don't remember them all. Maybe there's something that is more useful. It's often going to be the case that four, five, six facts that are in the library are enough to, to prove my goal. And this first part is going to do the first heuristic restriction of this part of the library to, uh, let's say, a thousand facts. And then the second part is the stronger part where actually the ATP says, out of this 1,000, I only need the following 10. With the information that only 10 facts from the library are necessary, often we can reconstruct the proof already on the proof assistant level. The hammers that have in the different systems significantly differ in power. Um, there are several reasons for this. First, uh, this heuristic part already that significantly affects how much we can do. Using a simple heuristic where we're looking at symbolic features of theorems and finding things that look similar to our problem is relatively weak using some kind of machine learning. So for proofs that look like this in the past, the following year was useful. So for proofs that look like commutativity, associativity in the past, we mostly use induction. This is not something that we can see uh, heuristically, but we can learn it from having looked at previous proofs and therefore we can suggest proof, we can suggest lemmas in a more meaningful way. So this is the first application of machine learning here. And for this, we want some good characterization of facts. And here, again, there's a lot of research on how we can characterize mathematical knowledge. The simple syntactic characterizations, this theorem talks about the zero or about the plus, it has some types and so on, those are relatively weak. Semantic characterizations that are going to try to see this theorem is true in certain models or uh, some abstractions and generalizations, so using the, the indexing structures, uh, those would be the strongest. Similarly, the different machine learning techniques can be used and that makes a very big difference. Power of the translation and how good is a reconstruction that again depends on the logic. For classical logics, we often can reconstruct almost everything for intuitionistic logic, say in Cockhammer, we're missing 10, 15%, but that's still quite good. Overall, uh, there has been a huge development in the power of such systems. When they were first created 15 years ago, if you think about the top level statements in the library, we could automatically prove about 20%. Now it's closer to 50, 60%. So this is a huge progress. And the starting ones that we have in, uh, in a new system, so let's say this uh, Metamath Hammer that was just recently created still is missing various features. It's a huge, uh, huge space to improve some kind of hammering for lean as well. So here I've been talking about the machine learning in the simplest way, so selection of things in the library, and that is, that is a cool, important thing, but we can use machine learning in various other ways in uh, proof assistance, and uh, because essentially formal proving is closer to playing a game. So we have something that we're trying to do. We have a certain moves that we can perform and how do we play game in the efficient way? One of the very good ways to play a game would be this alpha zero uh, thing, which has been shown to play very well, the games of Go, chess, whatever. Um, what does it essentially do? 
it essentially tries to do some kind of self-play, so it's performing moves and seeing how it's doing. It improves the strategy repeatedly. It tries to search the game tree wisely, so expand the parts that are more promising and expands less uh, the parts that are less promising, but still try to be complete about it. And an important thing is independently estimate moves and states. Can we do a similar thing for tier improving? Uh, we can. We can do automated proof, so we can, so, and, and again, we can do this on the level of a proof assistant or just on the level of an auto automated prover. Uh, we can, we have a certain calculus, we have certain possible moves, we can try to, try to execute them at the beginning randomly and then with the help of a certain strategy that is being improved, we can uh, estimate, so us, the estimation of moves and states was separate. Here we can estimate the different actions that say induction is a promising thing in the state, but doing rewriting is maybe less promising independently from proof states. So looking at the state, estimating how likely it is that I can prove a certain goal. And this would in the first order setting be done, for example, in Monte Carlo Tableau in the, uh, interactive theorem proving setting, we just have tactics and we can do this just by searching a tactical proof. And finally, the repeated strategy improvement is reinforcement learning applied to tier improving. For first order tier improving, this is pretty cool because we can prove something like 40% more theorems than a best human design strategy and even more with, uh, with stronger learning. And we can similarly do this in, uh, on the level of tactics, and we have systems like Tactic Toe for whole, uh, whole Four, we have Tactician for Cock that are searching the tree in such an intelligent way and trying to learn how to do this. These are today one of the strongest automation techniques. Apart from these that are working on the level of the prover, we can also integrate those into a hammer. So we, we I just have here as a, as a screenshot, uh, something from Isabel, where we can call Sledgehammer, where the prover is an automated theorem prover that is a learned prover that has been taught how to look at Isabel proofs. It has seen 300,000 Isabel automated theorem proving proofs. It learned this is the way to search them and it's doing things more efficiently than the other provers. This is also a, a cool domain and we have things like Lean Dojo that are going in this direction in Lean, but it's still quite far from what the best systems can do. So they're a bit helpful, but a lot more can be done. The next thing I want to talk about is the interaction with a proof assistant. I've already uh, mentioned that, these, that the proof assistant sometimes slows you down, that sometimes you are annoyed at how uh, non-intelligent it is, and the uh, complaint that I've been hearing is, the prover does not get what I mean, like completely clear things still need to be fully expanded. Even if I said something like, if you have this, then you always have to rewrite it. Always when you have x plus zero, uh, you change it to an x, why don't you do it by yourself? Why do I have to write it? If I've written it a hundred times, you should start to get it. Um, you have to say it again or implement some kind of expansion that's going to do it. And here, this, this example of this x plus zero is equal to x is a minor one, but there are some actions that you start repeating often enough and it's getting tedious, it's getting annoying. So in this sense, uh, proof assistants are uh, much weaker than high school students who are going to, at a certain point, sometimes after five, sometimes after 500, depending on, uh, depending on the particular case of, of the action that needs to be done, but they'll, they'll start to figure it out, they'll start to understand it, they'll start to do something. So could a computer learn how to uh, imitate this kind of interaction or even could the computer imitate what we are doing that is formalization. If I have LaTeX, can a computer convert it to a formal proof for me? This is 
pretty exciting. If we could do it, then like we don't have to do any formalization ourselves. We just write LaTeX and then the computer deals with it on its own. Um, there are there is some work that we have been doing already quite some time ago where you write something like sine of zero is cosine pi over two that is supposed to be some kind of uh, informal mathematical notation and then it tries to figure out what can it mean in whole light and it uh, probabilistically figured out there's uh, some number of possible par parses 12 of them i'm presenting to you and this one is definitely false these are true and they're true because of certain uh, because of certain justifications for some of them we don't know and then you can think ah this is the one i actually meant put it in my proof and i can continue from there um, here this arguably is a mistake because the parentheses was forgotten like you you think sine zero is cosine pi over two you actually want the parentheses there but uh if you ask any proof assistant, they're going to say, no, this does not work. I'm going to bind it in a different way. If you ask Wolfram Alpha, it will not know what's going on here with this kind of uh, statistical parsing or something that tries to interpret your statement in a various possible ways. Some of those would be ones that you actually mean that you want. This idea of going from informal text to something that is formal can be pushed even further and there are some groups that are applying various kinds of uh, heavier machine learning so neural networks for the task uh, and the cool thing that we've seen in uh, the last few years is that if you look at the at some papers that have been formalized and what the system generates for those um, we can find equivalent translations so this means that so what do i mean by equivalent let's say a implies b and not a or b in classical logic they're equivalent for more complex things we have here some uh, some definitions that are that are equivalent or some switching of quantifiers and so on and it just tries to translate it and it's still correct but a different one so it seems to be getting a little bit of the meaning of of formula so it's just not learning the syntax but a bit of semantics pushing machine learning for proof even further uh, is actually trying to automate what we're doing the automating mathematics and there are two things that we're trying to do we're trying to find a proof but find a proof in a very different way than co that computers do it um, if I am supposed to prove some more complex statement. I am going to make an intermediate step, do some kind of divide and conquer. I'll say, well, in order to prove C from the A, I'll make up a B that's going to be in the middle so that these two are much shorter. And if they're much shorter, then, then hopefully this is the, they're both will be much easier to do. So I make some intermediate lemmas. I try to propose such intermediate lemmas. This proposition of intermediate lemmas is, means I have a goal, but you can also try to do it without a goal. I have a proof library, let's say the lean mathematical library, and I could think what else could be true in the, in the, in the lean library? What else I could have there? Can you propose other things? So, uh, and there have been systems that, that do this in the statistical way, so we are seeing there are many constants for which, say, uh, commutativity, associativity, or distributivity has been proved. There's some constants for which it hasn't. Let's propose this as a conjecture, try to prove it, see if it works. So I imagine that humans already know what is commutative, what is not. So, so you're not going to find new things in this way. Uh, but for more complex kind of properties, we have a few successes. And generalizations of statements have also uh, been done. So we have things in the whole light library where a theorem was proved about uh, square matrices and the system said this is not just true for square matrices but it's also true for arbitrary rectangular matrices and not only that i can prove it for you so it, it it's pretty cool such examples we can count them on uh, one fingers of one hand at the moment but it's cool that, that people are working on this and it's happening um, you can try to feed all of math into uh, uh, 
generative neural network. And this was for the first time, for the first time do documented that, that I've been able to find was done by uh, Karpasi, uh, where he asked it, so then generate me some more LaTeX. And the cool thing is it's not only generating some random, I'll, I'll zoom in on it because I don't think it's readable. Um, it's not only just some random LaTeX, but it additionally compiles. That's pretty cool that the LaTeX that is generated actually works. There are some missing references, but if you try to read any paragraph, you will laugh. You'll see that it's like after this, it's already losing track what it's proving things about. So that, that, that is completely random. So this is likely not the way to go. And even if hear quite a lot about the power of these uh, GPT style uh, models that's not, uh, that is good at recreating things. It is pretty nice because if I have a million results in mathematics that, that I don't know, it's somewhere hidden in some weird book. If it read this book, it's going to be able to figure this out for me, but it's not going to create new ones. However, we also have these hip systems, so hip spec, hip stair, hip something. So Moa Johansson has been having uh, fun with naming the systems with a hip beginning, uh, where if you are starting with a definition of some theory, let's say we have a data type of binary trees, you define two functions, the mirror function and the mapping function that, that does apply something to the, uh, to the nodes of your binary tree. You ask the system to tell me what is true about it and it generates two lemmas, uh, mirror of a mapping is the same as a mapping applied to the mirror, uh, and mirror is the original thing. It finds these, it proves those, actually it generates many more. It uses this quick uh, check thing to eliminate the ones that are false and only for the ones that are actually candidates, it spends some time trying to prove it. So here we have just two, if you give it more, it finds more properties. That's that's nice thing, this is a symbolic one and we have a few more modern neural ones that can do some things as, and the power is, is different. It's not stronger, it's just able to do different things. I also want to say something about implementation considerations. Um, one feature of systems that existed before would be soft types. Um, this is a choice already in the logic, in the typing system, that uh, objects are not typed with a unique type, but rather we can show that objects have particular types. So we can say that, that but additionally, we later say, oh, it's an even natural number, and this is a valid type in the system. And everything that is a, an even natural number is a natural number. So that's this intersection types, meaning this is both even and is a natural number. We, have, we can describe things as a bijective function of a B. We have things like an n-dimensional vector space where this n is, an, is a parameter and this is a part of a typing system. This is very cool uh, because we can then uh, describe things with several so-called adjectives and prove that a certain object has more properties, that more adjectives satisfy uh, a type of a thing. So this means we have no need for coercions. In lean, they're very small. We have this tiny arrow, but in a few places, it still has to be there. In uh, the various softly type systems, so Mizar would be maybe the largest example, the N is a subset, I actually wanted the subset EQ, uh, but it's a, uh, it's a subset of R and the same thing for structures. Every time we have a structure that has some fields, it's naturally also this, the structure with a, a bit fewer fields and there's nothing to prove, there's no question, it is just the same object. The way uh, this is typically done is you derive all the numbers together. Um, the way Chad Brown has done it, is he would formalize the Conway numbers and say, the natural numbers are a subset of that, the, uh, the integers are a subset of that, the real numbers are a subset of that, of that, ordinals are a subset, and you have the relations between them, and everything that is one type is immediately the other type. This is pretty nice. It has 
some other problems and most type theoretic systems cannot combine uh, the, uh, the intersection types with dependent types or things get too complex, but it would be interesting if we can do this better in the foundations. For some time, there have been a struggle about including partiality in the foundations of a proof of system. This comes from the IMP system by Bill Farmer quite a long time ago that worked very well for, for not needing to specify all these site conditions. The way modern systems work is division would either have some very weird arguments that you can, it has to be total, so uh, division by zero is defined to be some value. Let's say division by zero is equal to zero. That's the case in several holes. Division by zero is equal to a fixed constant called undefined for which you cannot prove anything, but you know that it is of a certain type. That's also weird. The fact that you have to prove uh, things meant for a long time. Um, do I have chalk? Yes, I do. For a long time, uh, the division in Koch would have these three arguments. So I have A divided by B divided by a proof that B is different from zero. So, and actually this B can be inferred. So you would typically write something like A divided by a proof of, of the fact that B is different from zero, which is kind of a weird thing, but this has existed for a long time and it's one possible approach. Fixing partiality in the foundations is still a long open thing. We had a system that worked well for this, but it included many other features, so yeah. And uh, one more thing that is quite deep in the implementation that people have considered would be to think about the notion of obviousness. The, uh, the Białystok Research Group has investigated mathematical texts and seen what is considered a proper size of a mathematical text, of a mathematical step. If something is too long, if something is a too big jump, the system should not accept it. With this, you can claim, I do not need any tactics. I am just saying, well, from this follows this row, this without any justifications, if your system implements exactly a certain notion. Um, with larger proofs, we may need parallel proof checking. There have been various approaches to doing this. For example, in Isabel, the um, Isabel group would additionally fund the offers of PolyML to improve their, uh, to improve the programming language in which Isabel is written so that it can support uh, multiple threads. There are some future proofs where something is kind of finished, but it's still computing and you continue with other things. You see it in the interface, it's still violet, which means we're still, we're still verifying that. And for a typical Isabel formalization, we get maybe an eight times parallelization thanks to the, uh, thanks to the mechanism, but it stops there. This would be little for the really big formalizations. In FlySpec, we have close to a thousand uh, nonlinear inequalities that can be checked completely separately. There are no additional definitions needed there. You just need to verify that a certain inequality holds. We'll need it later in the proof, but they just need a certain large decision procedure. And uh, the way it would be done is some uh, Azure cloud service would rent out a number of computation hours, and there you would run processes with this input-output value mechanism. This that's almost unlimited parallelization on those, but do you trust the input output? Well, as long as the images are exactly the same checkpointed, you should, but yeah. How to parallelize proof checking? How can it work very well? It's still somewhat open and the, these large proofs are coming because this is one of the important use cases of formal proof assistance. So we have the proofs that are really big and that a single mathematician has trouble wrapping their head around the whole thing. That's why we want to, uh, that's why we want to verify these. Proof objects, we have various approaches to dealing with proof objects. Maybe I'll skip this and I'll skip one more section that I had and rather focus on the uh, on the conclusions. We have really many features of provers that have, uh, that are there, and these features often rely on something in the foundation. The 
whole base provers or even provers based on classical first order logic, but then with set theory, so are the ones where automation can flourish best. Um, the reason is we have very strong automated reasoning for these. That's what the domain focuses on. There are arguably some automation techniques also for intuitionistic proof. So Jens Otten has been developing these intuitionistic automated provers that are supposed to be efficient, but they're, they're still an order of magnitude uh, slower than slower in terms of we cannot do as much than in the classical setting. The same is true for many other extensions that we want. So Chad Brown has spent a lot of time expanding automated theorem improving to choice, which is excellent. We need it in many uh, interactive developments, but indeed doing that is a major thing. Machine learning has been coming to the guidance to help the automation already for some time. And the premise selection is quite well understood. The guidance of actual inferences, both on the level of, uh, of some small proof step and on tactical levels is still something that we have to investigate quite a lot. Computer algebra like transformation, so simplifications, computations of properties of, of some finite objects or um, that's a large important thing. LaTeX, web and wikis, I skipped on the whole section about these uh, parallel development on these communities trying to work on things. I'll just mention this in one sentence. When uh, Tom Hales has been developing FlySpec, he has tried to uh, motivate the mathematicians, in that case, some good, strong mathematicians in working in Vietnam by putting bounties on conjectures by saying, well, if you are going to prove this, you're getting $50 or $100. And there have been hundreds of such things and people have been working on it more eagerly because they know, well, this gives me a physical bonus. I can get myself something for it. Um, and there is also quite a bit of uh, ways to build a community around things and maybe with bounties, maybe without to, to deal with it. LCF, so being able to define tactics for particular things on the fly is a major thing that Isabel can exploit. Whenever I'm working on something like uh, nominal logic, if I want to work with binders and want to abstract from what is the actual name, I'm going to develop a small package. I'm going to spend a few days on something that's going to provide me stronger induction, stronger recursion, and then all my proofs are going to become 10 times shorter. This, this would be needed only for a particular small branch of science, and we uh, don't know what you need in your development. You may need to do it yourself, and if you do it yourself, do you have a nice language for it? Um, is it efficient enough? So these are the two considerations. It's coming there in most systems in a certain way. Sometimes these are uh, compiled plugins. Sometimes you can do things in the internal language, but if it's interpreted, this may be too slow. And finally, there have been systems that try to include all these features, that try to build this like Swiss army knife that has everything. And unfortunately, many of them are less popular. When I was starting my PhD, so this is like almost 20 years ago, the Omega system uh, around here in, in Germany has tried to include many things for formal proofs um, and they, they tried to um, include all these interfaces in a common uniform way. Nowadays, have you heard about the Omega system? Whole4 has also for a long time tried to include all possible packages into the standard development, but after a while it became too hard to update some of the features because many of the packages would break. So including too much may be dangerous, I don't know, but I hope we can figure out some best way and maybe Lean is going to be the system that will have everything, let's see. That's it, thank you. Yeah. 
All right, so uh, the best thing you can do is actually have a very small core such that you can read it. And in case of whole light, the core is so small that it takes 15 minutes to read the whole kernel. Uh, this is something like 500 lines of code. And every time I teach a proof assistant course where I have a whole uh, semester on it, I would ask the students to read with me for 15 minutes all of it to just go through. And then uh, that means that among my students, it has been already a thousand that, that have seen it. And I imagine there have been uh, 10,000 people in the world that have seen the course. So, so I think it's relatively trusted in terms of human inspection. The other thing is actually trying to prove properties of a system in another system. And so uh, the, there are various ways how you can do it. You can try to express the properties in another foundation. So say like this variant of type theory can be done in set theory and you, you do the proof on paper and show that this is fine and the other way around. So in lean, I can make a model of set theory and show that this is fine. So, so uh, but for this, you really need the two systems. You need a set theoretic system and this, this works as well. One thing that is maybe a little bit dangerous, but that people have done would be to try to show that whole is fine in whole. That is dangerous, <laughs> get less turning in the grave. Uh, but um, if you strengthen the system a little bit, like let's say you add another axiom to it and show that with it, it can still end the other way around, that the original whole can prove whole without the axiom of infinity, then this is uh, also a thing that has been done as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, now let's say this is something I trust in. Now I want to use lean instead. Um, so the idea would be to prove that in prove in whole that lean the cause of lean is correct. It is possible, but it and is a significant have, work. Have things like this been done on? For lean, I don't think that the whole thing has been done, but there are these projects like KML candle that have been doing this for different whole implementations. So in one system, you show that the other one is completely consistent. And that is pretty cool because you have these, uh, the whole with the minimal set of inferences and some much bigger version that is much more efficient. And you can show that the big one is fine with respect to the small one. That, that's precisely what the KML project does. Right, right. Yes. Right. Right. Yes. So you you need to. So. The, all right. Uh, the question was: uh, In case of reinforcement learning. Uh, is there a progress both on evaluating the moves and evaluating the states? The way we would be realizing the, eva the evaluation of moves and states is first, we are having some proof state. And the, all the proof states, we say, let's say, take the, all the proof states in a library of a theorem prover. In each of the proof states, we evaluate all the tactics that we can think of. Let's say I take 10 different tactics that I know and I try to evaluate. I see which ones of those are going in the direction of the proof, right? And then, then how do I estimate if it's going in the direction of the proof? I can do it assuming I have an evaluation of how good a state is. I didn't tell you yet how to evaluate the state, but let's assume I have it. Then with this, I can see how good tactics are. And I can learn on this more precisely how good tactics are. So if I have the first one, I can learn the other one. Now, the other thing is, uh, I am also trying to explore my space randomly and sometimes I randomly find a proof or I get to a place that I'm sure I cannot prove, like I get to a place which says false is the thing to prove, then I know I cannot prove it. Those are again training data for the value, that is training data for a state, how good a state is. And if this is a state that is definitely provable or definitely not provable, then the states that led to the provable state are closer to it. So they're like, let's say that the other one is one, then this one is 0 0.9, right? And then if I have and two steps away from a proof, then I take 0 0.9 to power two and so on. So this is my 
training data for value training data for how likely it is to prove a certain theory. This is relatively weak, but it's already good enough to learn better the, uh, the policy, so to learn better which moves to take, and the better, I, the better moves I take, the more precisely I learn the value again. So these two you can learn together, and they both improve each other. Right, so this is, uh, how do you compare the, the new states that you see to states in the training data? There's a certain characterization that you have to make. And this characterization, like the simplest way, would be to use features, right? You say, oh, these are the constants that appear. These are, so let's say, I have uh, two times equality, one time a plus, and one time something. This is a very naive, but this gives a little bit. When you consider some subterms, anonymized, let's say like modulo alpha and so on, that's a little bit better, or you can actually use these more semantic characterizations where you're looking, this formula is true in certain models and the way I extract interesting models is out of a counter model finder. Those are much stronger features. With the much stronger features, I get stronger machine learning. And of course, you can use deep learning and just feed the text and hope it's going to figure it out. So far, this doesn't work very well. But uh, so, so the, the semantic features are better than just feeding it into deep learning, but we hope it might learn something more at some point. Yes. How do we know what should be a type and what should be a definition? Um, all right, so there's an, uh, I think there are, there are two things that you're asking about. One of them is, as a person who's formalizing things, how do you know what to encode where? Second thing, in a foundation of a proof assistant, what are the basic, uh, what are the basic building blocks? So do we have types and what are the types and what are constants and so on? So that, that, that second question is a, is a very philosophical question. You're choosing a foundation that you believe in. If you're a theorist, you say, well, I, you can even say I, there is no types at all. Everything is just a constant or a definition and so on. So that, that's a philosophical thing. Which foundation do you want? For the first question, sometimes there are choices and you're getting an intuition as you formalize things, what will be the more efficient one? I don't think there's a good way to say it. Let's say I want something like a um, like an even number and then this evenness could be just a predicate. It's a yes, no, but it could be something where I'm going to make an inductive definition and they're going to be, and these are alternative choices. I can imagine that one of those is a better one here, but in a new case, I don't know what's going to happen. And this, and this thing may really depend on the things you want to prove afterwards with it. And it may also uh, be the kind of automation you're going to get. So you may get stronger automation with one technique than with the other. But that's, I'm sorry, I, I say the, the, my best answer is intuition that comes from having played with these for a while. Yes. 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 You don't, you don't. So you, there is a way to define everything in such a way that you can, uh, but, but, um, uh, sorry. Uh, the question was, can you, uh, can, if you start with the Conway numbers that you get natural numbers being a subset of the, of the uh, rational numbers and so on. So this standard hierarchy is preserved, but there's something not fit, that cannot fit in this, let's say quaternions cannot fit in it, I don't know, uh, yes. Um, so uh, can we include them as well? Yes, in set theory you can define anything to be a set, but the typical way that you would do it is you would then say my, let's say, complex numbers are going to be real numbers plus additionally a set that includes the ones that are not the real numbers. And uh, so this is, you define them immediately as a union so that this subset relation holds. Uh, this is possible, this has been done in Mizar actually for everything. So natural numbers are not immediately coming out of the Conway numbers, they're just built in the, in the standard uh, 
in the standard set theoretic way where you add the, the element and, and, the, and it's, uh, the smaller numbers together in, into a set, so the, the, the very basic construction. And then when you build the more complex things, you say these are the natural numbers and the Cauchy sequences, but without the ones that correspond to the natural numbers, so something like this. And you can imagine that you do this for all the intermediate ones as well, but you can do this and then you can work with them naturally. As this is a slightly more complex definition, but as soon as you've done this definition once, then you can work with it without any coercions. And additionally, for the records that have various fields, a cool thing is a thing that has fewer fields will, will immediately be a superset of the one with the more fields. And that's something you don't have to prove. It, this depends again on the system. So in Mizar it would not be. Correct. Thank you.